Grace to you and peace. Welcome to the Second Congregational Church of Greenwich. My name is Lynn Kramer, and it is my privilege to be in the pulpit the next two weeks while Max Grant and Sean Guerin take a well-deserved break. Alexander Constantine, however, just keeps working and working, which is a blessing for us all. Today's service is being taped, so the chat function is not available, but we're very happy that you can join us online. Today is a holiday trifecta. Our secular holiday is Valentine's Day when we acknowledge those we love. The word love appears over 500 times in the Bible, and Jesus radicalized religion by putting the law of love above all others. So you could say that every Sunday is Valentine's Day in the Christian tradition. But especially today on the religious observance of Transfiguration Sunday, the last Sunday of the season of Epiphany when the glory of God is revealed through Christ as a symbol of God's love. The color of the stoles that we wear represent the church seasons and white is worn today to symbolize the purity of the Lord. The white stole is also worn on Christmas, Epiphany Sunday, and on Easter. Tomorrow is the national holiday of President's Day, which was signed into law in 1879 to memorialize George Washington's birthday. It became popularly known as President's Day in 1971 when it was moved to the third Sunday in February as part of the Uniform Monday Holiday Act to give workers more three-day weekends along with Memorial Day and Columbus Day, a move supported by the labor unions and retailers. As President's Day, we honor Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson, especially in Virginia, and all great U.S. presidents. This Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent, when we burn last year's palm leaves from Palm Sunday. We use the ashes to make the mark of the cross on our foreheads as a symbol of humility, sorrow, and repentance for our sins. During the 40-day Lenten period of reflection, we spiritually cleanse ourselves in preparation for the celebration of Christ's resurrection on Easter. Given the solemnity of the season, the word Alleluia will not be spoken or sung from this Wednesday until Christmas morning. You are invited to join Max this Wednesday on YouTube at 7 p.m. for our very special Ash Wednesday service, always one of the most solemn and moving of the church year. You can find the link for the service at 2cc.org. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
Let us pray. Gracious God, you have revealed yourself to us through Jesus Christ, and you speak to us through love. Forgive us, cleanse our hearts, and open our minds that we may be ready for the day when our world is transfigured, transformed, and made new. We ask it in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Throughout the Old Testament, God has ratified and renewed God's covenant with us from mountains, such as Mount Sinai, where God spoke to Moses, and Mount Carmel, where God met Elijah with fire from heaven. Today's monumental event takes place appropriately on a high mountain where the Trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit converge for one brief but indelible moment that changes the history of the world. Appearing in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this is the transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. May God bless to our understanding this reading of God's holy word.
have you seen something that fundamentally altered your perception of yourself or of someone else or of the world? When the boundaries between the human and the divine become blurred. Maybe you displayed courage you didn't know you had or you witnessed a surprising display of emotion by someone you considered incapable of feeling. Or you were caught off guard by an unexpected an undeserved act of kindness. Such moments comprise life's epiphanies, fleeting moments of insight that reveal a reality that was buried beneath the surface and beyond our understanding. James Joyce, who raised epiphany to a literary art form, described the experience as those times when a person's soul, a person's whatness, leaps to us from the vestment of its appearance and seems radiant, a sudden spiritual manifestation of divinity to our mortal eyes. On the rare occasion that it happens, we know that what we are seeing is the unvarnished truth, stripped of its veneer, exposed for one indelible moment, and we are changed. We may even need to reorder our thinking and adjust our assumptions to accommodate this unexpected truth and this new reality. That's because epiphanies are the essence of truth. Or as one of my confirmants once said, it's when we see with our soul. This soul sight, this exposure to ultimate truth, often defies language. Biblical epiphanies alter our view of reality by disclosing the divine power beyond ourselves. Epiphany Sunday, the second Sunday after Christmas, heralds the arrival of the wise men as they pay homage to the child revealed to them as the Christ child. 
Other epiphanies, such as Jesus' baptism and his miracle at Cana, also reveal his divinity and transcendent power. But it's the transfiguration, which we celebrate today, that has been called the epiphany par excellence of the Gospels. Because it is the transfiguration that reveals the glory to which we are called. In last week's scripture, the disciples learned of the impending death of Jesus, and even more troubling, they were instructed by Jesus to take up their cross and follow him. These dire predictions of Jesus' death are weakening their faith. They're exhibiting a willful blindness to the future they're facing, and beginning to even question their mission. So in today's scripture, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, the most influential disciples, up a high but unnamed mountain. And there, Jesus is transfigured before their eyes. His clothes become dazzling white, whiter than anyone on earth had ever seen, and he is joined by Moses and Elijah, the preeminent prophets of Israel who were visited by God and were chosen to speak for God in times of religious opposition. Moses and Elijah represent the Old Testament witness to the Messiah as he reveals himself to be the Son of God, the human embodiment of God's divine love. Peter, feeling terrified, nervously proposes building a, a sort of sanctuary for each of the three prophets. But he is stopped mid-sentence by the appearance of the Holy Spirit in the form of a cloud above them. And then God's voice repeats the baptismal blessing, this is my beloved son, but now adds the crucial instruction, listen to him. Listen to him, because it is by his new law, the law of love, that the world will now and forever be judged. What the disciples had failed to grasp was that Jesus doesn't lose his life. Jesus lays down his life as a gift of life-giving love for us. So God intervenes to under, uncover what had been hidden from human perception, the true nature of Jesus as Messiah. When we, along with Peter, James, and John see Jesus of Nazareth standing on the mountain, dazzling in his radiant majesty. Then we see the entire gospel, that God has chosen this man to transform the world, the one who is transfigured, transfigures all. Through the transfiguration, we witness a truth that we can neither change nor control, the power of God. We witness our frailty in relation to God's strength, our mortality in relation to God's immortality, our humanness in relation to God's divinity, and our sin in relation to God's salvation. Most of all, we witness the enduring love of God through the rare convergence of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in front of us, beside us, within us. The transfiguration is a fleeting vision and a true epiphany. Suddenly, when they looked around, the scripture says they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. Only Jesus, whose humanity as servant conceals his divinity. It is our humanity that he assumes in order to make us true children of God. That is God's revelation of love for us. It simply could not have been made clear. At one time or another, we may all have had an epiphany. It may have been a disturbing or disappointing burst of realization that exposes a person's dark nature or our own ugly truth. 
But there are also the epiphanies that renew our hope and strengthen our faith, when the deeper insight seems divinely inspired and is accompanied by a glimpse of the eternal. Very often at the heart of these epiphanies is true identity, the knowledge of who we really are, and the assurance that we are loved, not only in spite of it, but also because of it. Few people have lived a lie and suffered the consequences as severely as Steve Cusisto. Legally blind since birth, he was forced by his mother to hide his blindness and to try to pass as sighted. In grade school, the ordinary effort of reading became a whole body experience for him as he held his book an inch from his face and tried to stop the hot, pulsating muscle in his eye. The torture continued through adolescence and young adulthood. His refusal to accept any assistance filled his life with absolute terror of curbs, bicycles, trash can lids, holes and more holes, and forced him into isolation. In his autobiography entitled Planet of the Blind, he said, why should I it takes so long for me to like my blind self. I resist it, admit it, then resist again. As though blindness were a perverse weakness, a thing I could overcome with the force of will. Finally, having been captive to his disability for nearly four decades, Cassisto sought help from the New York State Commission for the Blind. After first learning to use a cane, he was eventually one of the lucky few chosen to receive a seeing eye dog. In a dramatic make or break moment, he was taken to one end of a long, empty room where he would be introduced to the dog that had been trained and specifically selected for him. He prayed that the dog, a female named Corky, would like him. Because if she didn't, Corky would be placed with someone else. The sliding glass doors opened, and he heard the curtains billowing. He called Corky's name. Then he heard the musical dog tags coming closer, and suddenly she was on top of him. Her paws were on his knees, and she was kissing him. Tears became, began streaming down his face, and the dog's trainer announced, Corky's in love. Cassisto wrote, Corky and I were romping like William Blake's emancipated chimney sweeps, freed from their soot and sporting in the air. And I said to her, let's you and I take care of each other. And so at age 39, Stephen Casisto learned to walk upright and to embrace the world. In accepting his weakness, he became whole. The Transfiguration is a story about hidden identities of Jesus and of us. We are the secrets we keep. It is also a story about blindness and sight, the desire to seek the truth and the courage to face it, coming to terms with the truth and using our soul sight, particularly about ourselves, is undoubtedly one of the greatest challenges we face. But admission of our frailty and brokenness is at the heart of Christianity. Recognition of our human failure is a true sign of strength. It is the first step to overcoming our blindness and regaining our strength. Seeking God's help is the second step. Stripped of all pretense and authentically ourselves is when we experience true grace. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end 
His mercies are new every morning. Max alluded to this passage from the Old Testament book of Lamentations last week when he reminded us to seek God with open hearts each morning and to watch in faith for the flame to be lit anew. Open in our seeking and fearless in our following, he said. In other words, open to the touch of God, to, glimpse, to glimpses of the beauty of the Almighty and to signs of hope. Fearless in our devotion to God and to our discipleship of the kingdom of God. Years ago, I read about a doctor and a young couple. The young woman had undergone surgery that had severed the nerve on her cheek and permanently disfigured her face. She asked the doctor, will my mouth always look like this? The doctor said, yes, unfortunately, it would. She nodded and was silent. But then the young man smiled and said, I like it. It's kind of cute. Then he bent to kiss her crooked mouth, twisting his own lips to accommodate hers, to show her that their kiss still worked. The doctor wrote all at once, I know who he is. I understand and I lower my gaze. One is not bold in the encounter with God. I remember that the gods appeared in ancient Greece as mortals, and I hold my breath and I let the wonder in. The transfiguration is God's gift of grace for all who struggle to see, to hear, and to believe in Jesus. It exposes the contrast between the heavenly and the earthly, the infinite and the finite, the divine and the human. It gives us a brief vision of the meaning of eternity, of God, of Jesus, and of ourselves. Most of all, the transfiguration opens us to our own mountaintop epiphanies to catch a glimpse of the extraordinary in our ordinary lives, to capture the singular moment that gives meaning to our lives and to life itself. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. God of renewal and hope, be with us as we pause to reflect on the blessings and challenges of our lives. We sing songs of praise, we read your words of scripture, and we feel closer to the source of all that is meaningful and true. We celebrate a faith that is an essential and blessed part of our being. And we celebrate the many ways that you nourish and inspire us, console and sustain us. We come to you with our fears, praying for your reassurance. We also come knowing that your mercy is endless and that your compassion is unlimited. As the world's pandemic rages on, we ask your help for all who have been victimized by COVID-19. For the nearly two and a half million people worldwide who have died of it. For all who have lost loved ones to it. And for all who are suffering lingering effects. We give heartfelt thanks first and foremost for the brave heroic and dedicated health care workers who have witnessed more suffering than anyone ever should. We give thanks, too, for the vaccines that are now available and for the hope that they bring. But we cannot forget those who still struggle to find work, to buy food, and to support their families during this time of financial hardship. We pray for the exhausted mothers who must juggle work and parenting in ways never before imagined. And we pray for all who struggle with isolation, those who are lonely, anxious, and feeling unloved. Shed your light on your darkness Provide them with comfort and healing that they may feel your touch. Help us to hear the voices of those in need and give us courage to respond. Give us soul sight to appreciate those things that are of lasting, imperishable, and eternal value whenever and wherever we see them. And help us discern your call to true faithfulness, to work for the coming of your kingdom of mercy and justice and life everlasting. As we celebrate the great presidents of our country, we pray for the welfare of nations and the wisdom of governments, for social justice and for racial harmony. May laws dignify and not degrade. And as always, we pray for the safety of all men and women in the military, working to preserve, protect, and defend our democracy. Merciful God, turn our sight outward and upward toward your truth and light, that we may see the bounty and the beauty of all you have created. You have given us every good thing, and you have given us the tools with which to maintain those gifts. May our actions reflect your glory and be worthy of it. O oh, love that calls us, names us, blesses us, and will not let us go, we pray in the name of him who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
has God been revealed to you? In what way have you experienced the eternal or felt the presence of the divine? As we enter the season of Lent, it is customary for Christians to give testimony to their faith, and we at Second Church want to hear what those experiences have been for you. So for the next several weeks, we are asking that you share your epiphanies and experiences of God. Send them via email to pam at 2cc.org, pam at 2cc.org, and we will print them in the newsletter so others may be inspired. We thank you so much for this contribution to our community of faith. A year before his death, Thomas Jefferson, our third president and principal author of the Declaration of Independence, wrote this advice to a friend's son. Adore God, love your neighbor as yourself, be just, be true. So shall the life into which you entered be the portal to one of eternal bliss. Now go and tell the good news that the Lord of light and life is with us. And may God bless you and keep you May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs>